We're going to know what NASA believes are the actual uh, prerequisites for human space flight and what requirements for various that's, vehicles. That's our plan. Okay. And, Mr. Cook, do you think that uh, it would be more expensive to uh, – uh, of course, we don't know what those requirements are yet. The government part hasn't done their job yet to, to see what those requirements are. But once they do, do you think it will be uh, more costly uh, or, uh, for, or less costly to proceed with having Delta and Atlas meet some of those qualifications and, and meet those requirements versus the $9 billion that we have already spent on Aries of Orion that hasn't gotten us anywhere? I can't. I really can't speculate until we do solicitations okay. and get. Let's see, Mr. Y Mr. Young should answer that too. If I can answer a couple of your questions, that you, uh, if you did, if the chair would allow, I I've got to go back. Allow me. Um, you mentioned airplanes. You know, good good analogy. Um, I'm a big admirer of our, of our airplane industry. Even today, airplanes. It's a very mature industry. Airplanes land every day with problems that would be catastrophic in the human spaceflight program. Every day. They've probably done it while we've been having this, this hearing. So I think the analogies, you know, uh, are interesting but not directly applicable. If we come back to uh, the requirements, and I think what Doug Cook said of NASA levying the requirements for safety is a good thing to do, but I'll remind all of us that the reason things fail today won't be in those requirements documents. In other words, the requirements will not say don't confuse English and metric units, which is the reason Mars 98 failed. It won't say don't write down the wrong number in the guidance equation for a Titan IV, which is why a Titan IV failed. It won't say don't let the foam hit the leading edge of the wing. And the only thing I really, the point I'm really trying to make is the requirements, the safety requirements are important, and they should be done. But they won't get the job done. What will get the job done, we repeating again, is the strength of NASA and the incredible strength of industry, you know, working together to, uh, to make these items happen. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the launch vehicle, EELV. Uh, two comments. First off, the EELV started out as a commercial enterprise, as you know, as well as I do, obviously. Yeah. Um, there were a large number of space, uh, of space system failures. Uh, I chaired a review for Lockheed Martin. Sheila Woodall chaired one for Boeing, looked into that. And Larry Welch chaired a presidential commission to look into the launch vehicles. And out of that, the presidential commission's basic conclusion was that EELV proceeding as a commercial system when the per commercial market fell apart and didn't really happen were following practices that were not consistent with the practices that we knew were necessary to make these things have a sufficiently high probability of success. So the ELV program was changed, and it was changed to implement techniques that we have experience with that we know how to make these things work. So ELV is no longer, you know, really a commercial system. And your other comment about uh, we could certainly take the ELV and we could human rate it. Right. Aerospace did a, did a study. They said it would take between five and a half sub, and seven years right. uh, to do that. I must admit I'm kind of struck by it being that long, to be honest, but that's what they said. They, they identified no basic cost advantage. And in addition to that, um, what I know about it is that if what you would like to do is to take your initial tr space transportation system that you went back and forth to the space station, and you'd like to be able to grow that, to, uh, and I'm now working your economic equation, you'd like to be able to grow that to a heavy lift. You'd like not to have two systems. And there's no question in my mind, and Doug should currently comment, no question in my mind, you can grow something like an Ares-1 into a heavy lift capability much more efficiently than you can grow an EELV into a heavy lift uh, capability. And I think, again, if you go back and look at the details of that aerospace study, you know, it'll kind of support that. So, again, the point I, you know, that you and I have really been discussing, and I always enjoy my discussions with you, I should say. Thank you. And by the way, it's a, it's a terrific example of what I'm trying to say, is I end up with better thoughts having debated with you 
and I hope maybe you have, at Dayton Absolutely. and me. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and that's really what I'm talking about is how NASA and industry works together. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Young, and thank you, Mr. Warbeck. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to we're um, going to about draw to a close and because um, we're expecting votes shortly. But I want to um, just ask as we close here, uh, Mr. Cook, in reference to Mr. Warbarker's point, what new technologies has Constellation developed? <laughs> um, in in the Constellation program, we actually have some uh, technologies we've been working that will be potentially. Uh, uh, migrated into into our technology programs. Uh, automated rendezvous and docking is one that we're working on the on the Orion. Um, in the upper stage, we're we're making further progress on on the technology of friction stir welding. Um, we are working composite structures. We've made some advances in lightning protection on space vehicles. Um, advanced batteries. Um, we're using advanced solar arrays on the spacecraft. Um, we, have, we are making uh, advances in guidance, navigation, and control, and other, other avionics software uh, that, that, that will be possible. Uh, we've we've uh, actually, in, in advanced development work um, out, at, out at Ames, we've, um, we've developed uh, technology in, in thermal protection system, for, uh, advanced thermal protection systems for spacecraft. Um, we're working in, in, in uh, closed-loop life support, and we've, we're actually charting some new territory and modeling of, of the environments and, and characteristics of spacecraft during launch and entry through new modeling techni techniques and software. Uh, thank you. I mean, as you described, a number of new technologies developed in that little government-supported program. Um, Mr. Cook, just as we as we do close, by the end of the authorization and appropriations process, I hope that we in the administration can craft a productive path forward for NASA's human spaceflight program. And given the concerns expressed by members both on and off the committee over the suitability and sustainability of the proposed redirection, we're going to be looking at this investment that we've already made in the Constellation program, significant investment to see whether it and how it can be part of the solution. And um, in, in that regard, I mean, you've just completed the Constellation program's um, PDR. Uh, what's the status of Constellation? Does it have any fundamental problems, or is it on track technically? And just a yes or no answer would be good for that. Uh, just briefly, the, um, the board for the preliminary design review did did recommend um, it, its advance toward critical design review, which, I mean, we are, we are working issues as, as all programs do, but, but um, they're, they're being worked. And is there, is there, on the commercial side, are they anywhere near that? Well, at this point, um, we're not developing the commercial crew yet, and that's what right. this new program is for. Exactly. Thank you. Um, uh, and just uh, finally, though, um, you know, we're t we, I hope that part of what you've heard here today is that um, we don't believe, many of us on this committee don't believe that, the, um, that NASA either has the authority or the, either through appropriations or authorization to terminate programs at this stage. This is a work in progress, and so I hope you'll go back to your superiors and urge them to rethink any approach in dealing with Constellation during the remainder of the fiscal year that might impact it um, and the full program for the future, given that we haven't closed out the conversation yet. Uh, this is of deep concern to many members of the committee. It's a, a concern that I have, as we've heard it over and over again, both in terms of the impact on the workforce, um, but also the impact on the program, given that Congress hasn't weighed in yet on the President's um, budget proposal. Um, be, I want to thank our witnesses for testif testifying before the subcommittee day today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and for answers to any follow-up questions the subcommittee may ask witnesses. And the witnesses are excused, and the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you very much.